to Dying in Grace, the program that aims to integrate end-of-life wellness and living together as fully as possible. Our program designs to take all kinds of topics related to death and make it palatable and embrace it and understand um, how we can change the landscape of that last taboo. Each week I bring a community expert to talk about some area about living well and dying well. And this week I have a return guest. I'm really excited of, of having a return guest. And before I tell you about him, I want to, to know that uh, this is part two of his talk. And for all of my viewers, if you go to dyingandgrace.com, you can watch my guest first episode, his first discussion, as well as all the past episodes of Dying in Grace. So with that, I am most happy to invite back and welcome back my friend, the Executive Director of Ventures and Caring, Simon Fox. Thank you, Arlene. I appreciate being here. and Thanks for bringing me back. Yeah, yeah. well, we're calling this Oxygen for Caregivers Part 2. Good. So, yeah. <clears throat> so again, um, just for people that don't know about what Oxygen for Caregivers is, just a synopsis of what is that? Well, it's an outgrowth of our mission um, to uh, support people's well-being um, during crises um, through health and uh, illness, through, through illness and injury and, and even in the dying process. Um, the, how we came across this was um, through our student volunteers who mm -hmm. visit the, the very frail elderly throughout the community. They are also pre-med students, most of them. And uh, they started asking us about, they, they see their doctors who are 20, 30 years ahead of them in the, in the uh, career path, and they were worried about the amount of burnout they were seeing. We see it with nurses too. So they asked us a very simple question, how do I not burn out? Uh, simple question, harder to answer. So this course, Oxygen for Caregivers, is an, is, is a, an attempt to answer that. Mm -hmm. And so it's for, for all kinds of caregivers, uh, doctors, nurses, allied health professionals, emergency services, first responders, on, on how, do, what do you need to weave into your life in order to protect yourself from burnout, to, to build your resilience, and to sustain your own compassion and capacity to care. And, and what are those ingredients? And that's, that's what the course is all about, because, um, you know, burned out caregivers are not a source of comfort to anyone. No, no. Right. And, um, you know, I think when we talk about this profession and I, uh, well, this profession, first responders, um, these days teachers, uh, right. you know, and I mean, the, the field, the stress and, and burnout is yeah. epidemic. Um, but there are some occupational hazards um, that right. you've talked about. So, so can you uh, tell us, what are some of the occupational hazards that happen to people in the medical profession, for instance? Right. Um, I mean, th the term burnout is used as a catch-all. Right. There, there are dis distinct kinds of stressors, and they're, they're really syndromes. They're gr groups of symptoms. And there's the three, excuse me, there's two main types that are a double whammy for the health professions, that are unlike, this, what I'm speaking of is people who are, people who come to face to face with human suffering on a regular basis. Um, and for them, it's not just the heavy workload, it's also the coming, encountering trauma. And so the different kinds, there's six main kinds of, um, of, of this burnout. Three are, have to do with exhaustion. There's burnout, which is like dealing with stuff in the workplace that's just you know, workload, right. poor management, things like that. Um, the second one is compassion fatigue, which is an emotional exhaustion from giving and giving and giving and giving and giving and mm -hmm. giving until you, you, you're out. Right. Um, and so that's got more to do with the relationships that you have. And then there's a moral distress, which is an exhaustion of um, fighting with your conscience over things you've been asked to do that morally, ethically, you don't agree with. 
-hmm. like nurses who are you know forced to discharge a patient and send them home when they're not ready to go home mm -hmm. and there's this 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 ethical struggle so those are three kinds of exhaustion if you will and then there's three kinds of traumatization secondary trauma which comes from hearing stories of you know tragic uh, stories that bother you that keep you up at night sure um, that's a secondary trauma then there's a vicarious trauma which is more of that only it's after you've heard hundreds of these stories that really start to change your whole view of the world that's vicarious trauma and then this primary trauma is when it happens to you mm -hmm. or when you're in danger mm -hmm. um, and nurses for example experience more on the job violence than any other profession mm -hmm. so yeah you th and people you know, don't even think about that they don't th you know nursing aides they they get more injuries than construction workers. Right. So, so there's real hurt going on. Yeah, in, in the, the physical profession. hurt, not yeah. to mention everything that they're watching. Yeah. You know, I am aware that trauma-based care is becoming um, more of an awareness in society. I'm mm -hmm. hearing it in the medical field. I'm hearing it. Um, in terms of child abuse and, and how yeah. that it looks at incarceration. So there is an awareness that um, we all, ha well, hopefully we haven't all, but most of us have had some kind of traumatic event mm -hmm. or you know, had some vicarious experience, the mudslides being right. a perfect example of that, whether you were yourself were there. I mean, we all were traumatized by that. Mm -hmm. so, so we have this, and, and so... Um, what's, so we identify the problem and then what? We, you know, right. you have a program, so okay, anybody can say, yep, I got it. Right. What is the, so, what do I do? Now that okay. I know what I got, what, what's my step? What action can I do to help support myself? Exactly. Um, and that's usually the, the question and, you know, and, um, there's no prescription for this. What we're talking about is, is how do you move from, from suffering, whether it be trauma or, or stress or, or worry, um, but how do you move from there to well-being? Because it's the well-being, it's this, it, it's important we don't confuse excellence with, with wholeness. Because a lot of people you know, think, well, I'll, I'll go run run more and exercise more and this is not a sport it's about how do we um, develop this capacity for balance and strength and resilience and it, it has to do it, it's not got to do with how good you are in a particular field it's got to do with actually how do you best deal with your own weaknesses because mm -hmm. that's what gets you in trouble right. you're only as strong as your weakest link right and that's usually what trips people up. So it's like, how do we become whole and develop well-being? And it, it's a journey. It's not a, it's not a regimen. Everybody thinks in terms of, terms of uh, self-care regimens. You know, I should meditate more. I should do yoga more. I should run more. I should walk right. more. The list right? can be exhausting in itself. It, it is. And, and that's the whole point. You don't get, I mean, people are on this treadmill of tasks. And you don't get relief from by just getting a different treadmill right. it, it, uh, or adding more tasks to it is you need to be able to get off it right and, and take a break and so and it all comes to do it's all got to do with attitude um well and i wanted to say yeah. one thing that i that i think you know i really appreciate what you're saying about striving for you know excellence and mm -hmm. the confusion of excellence and well-being right but there's also what I see a lot, and I think it's another reason why people get exhausted and burned out, is the confusion between perfection and striving for excellence. Mm -hmm. You know, to me, right. so striving for excellence, I, I'm striving for that, I can fail. But if I'm a perfectionist, what I do when I fail is all part of the capitulation and the yeah. downfall because in my head, now I'm running whatever else the external factors are internally. I'm also taking my own toll on myself, you right. know, and so I see that a lot, particularly in these fields, you know, you talk about medicine, I mean, if you make an error, someone's life could be exactly. endangered, so there is, 
you know, almost a hypervigilance that puts there its is. own level of stress in the day-to-day -day operation that becomes the norm for people. They mm -hmm. don't even realize it, right. you know. So yeah. as we, we move towards a well-being, you know, what, how do we move towards that? You know, if it's right. not a list of to-dos of taking, you know, eating right exactly. and exercising and getting more sleep and all those things that are good ideas, but right. what is it then? What's the difference here? Well, the difference is um, Balfour Mount and his team in uh, McGill University in, in Montreal, um, did a, he did a great paper called Healing Connections. And then the subtitle was On Moving from Suffering to Well-Being. And uh, this was a study, it was about terminal patients, but um, what they were starting to see was quality of life didn't depend on a person's state of health. It mm -hmm. depended on something else. And they were trying to figure out what is that. So on a careful reading of, of his paper, it became clear to me that there were three main things that he was saying that that got you to move from however it was that you were suffering to a greater state of well-being. And what they are is you have to have, be able to do these three things. You have to be able to access your own inner resources. You have to be able to reconcile your own inner pain. And you have to be able to reframe your perception of threat to one of challenge. And so this entire course, Oxygen for Caregivers, is to design to build those three abilities in you. Uh, so that you can actually, because if you can't access your inner resources, I, well actually, in, so in order to do those three, three, three things, you have to develop new senses. You have to have a self-awareness. You, you yeah, cannot do this blind. I was going to say, blind. somebody would say, well, I don't even, what is an inner resource? Exactly. What well, is how, within how can I, even? Yeah, I don't you know, even, what is right. That? So, so what, what, right. what does the course tell me about my inner resources? Exactly. Well, it helped. It, this is a journey of self-discovery. Mm -hmm. So you could, yeah, it's a course, but actually it's, it's a journey of self-discovery. And who you're studying in the course is mostly you. Uh-huh. Right? So it's skillfully designed to help you understand in, in plain English, without using psychological terminology, how to do this and, and how to build self-awareness. There's four different kinds of self-awareness that, that help you to see what you see and hear what you hear and feel what you feel and know what you know. Be mm -hmm. able to do that and actually practice it. And then there's the whole, this whole idea of inner, this sense of inner balance. Because if you don't have that, you don't notice that you're out of balance until way too late. And there's also this sense of inner connectedness where you feel that you have strong lifelines to your sources of renewal. You've got strong links. Um, because, and you see this in people who commit suicide. They, they lose touch with what is meaningful to them. Um, I mean, it, it all comes back to, you know, what good is it if you gain the world and lose your soul in the process, mm -hmm. right? So it's all about what is it that's feeding your soul? What actually helps you um, in a very real way that will stand up in the face of death or stress or tragedy? Mm -hmm. So that's the, and who we've interviewed, we've interviewed dozens and dozens of people for this program and they were all experienced, and actually I'm, what I'm proud of is that it's evolved out of the Santa Barbara community. Mm -hmm. These are caregivers in the Santa Barbara community who are, have been sharing their wisdom. And there so are your program who, yeah. has, has developed because these very caregivers are saying to you, this is how I exactly. get renewal. This is yeah. how I'm able to go back on the job after right. a, a tragedy. This, this, so, so this is not theory. This right. is, this this is, is actual practice. This yeah. is you're calling the wisdom yeah. of, of the people in the field and then putting it in terms in a, in a way that anybody could access it for themselves. Exactly. And, and do it in a, in a way that they gain the same right. ability to move towards well-being. It is. In fact, through this, the course we've developed, it, 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 gives, it introduces people to those very caregivers who are sharing their wisdom. Uh-huh. And, and so it's, it's the real, it's, we, we call it real world self-care. It's what, what do people actually do? Right. Not, not the quote best practices or what the experts tell you you should do. What people actually do. 
And what they actually do is they invent their own way. They adapt stuff and, and they make it fit their life. And that's one of the key things. It, unless it fits in your life, you're not going to keep doing it. Right. If, if you prescribe it for me, it's like anything. You know, the, per, yeah. the doctor writes you a script or you get yeah. a physical therapy exit. Unless you believe in it, it's, right. just, it's just a piece of paper. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. So this is the, what the, this journey does. It helps you find those things and refine them and zero in on exactly what it is that's going to actually move you to, in, to a better place. And then build commitment to that and build and find out who are your allies are going to help you do that. So the whole journey is, takes you to a better place and we even have measures in the front end and the back end to show your progress. Mm -hmm. And that's all based on post, the, the work in post-traumatic growth, where people, based on people who have thrived through adversity. Because that's mm -hmm. the most powerful form of resilience you can get is people, from the people who have actually gone through really tough stuff and they come out the other side better stronger, wiser. Right. Because um, that, I mean, what, the whole thing with like compassion fatigue, it, it makes a demand of us. And the demand compassion fatigue makes is that our compassion must become wiser. Mm -hmm. we, That's we, the, yeah. We cannot just go blindly give, 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 fall over. Right, it, it, right, it's, right. It's, so, I mean, it's not, the, vacillating between self-neglect and self-indulgence is not balance. It's right, but that's often what people choose, and you yeah. see those extremes, you self-medicate in whatever right. your medication of choice is, whether it's chocolate or alcohol or drugs right. or exercise or whatever. They can it's, all be numbing agents. Right, yeah. right, and, and in the name of self-care, you know, right. you, spend, you run 20 miles a day so you don't right. have to feel what you're feeling. Right. Uh, you know, when, when you talked about the adversity, I, I, I know that we share a mutual hero, and that's Viktor Frankl. Yeah. And, you know, for people who don't know, his book, Man's Search for Meaning, was very much about him being in a Nazi prison camp, a psychiatrist, and observing who survives and who doesn't. Right. And it is about the choice that people make about how they're going to be with what is. Yeah. That's really what you're talking about to a degree. Precisely. No, that's it. it. That's what it comes down to. And for Frankel to say that, you know, that you can choose your own attitude when he was in Auschwitz. Right. We have no wiggle room on our end. For, if he can do that there, right? Right, He's right. like, oh, I'm busy. No, you have a choice. Right, <laughs> and it's, it's kind of that stimulus yeah. response, and people go, well, it's a reaction, it's a reaction. Well, no, there's, there is a, a beat in there yeah. where the reaction can be shifted to a response. It can indeed. And, yeah. and I think that's essentially what this program is helping people do. Is oh, it make does. Make the shift, we, the choice. We, to, um, the, yeah, we, we built breathing space into the, this course, this journey. You know, like with, with music, with poetry, with, uh -huh. with, with gorgeous scenery, so that the course itself is a breath of fresh air. The very taking of the course does reduce your stress. Ah, not just great. learn about it, right. actually does it. And, and so that's, we, we created this way, because why? Because people who are taking it are stressed out to begin with. Right. We didn't want it to be a burden to them. Right. We wanted it to be a pleasure. Something, something that they would like so much, they would take it again just because it felt so good. And are you that, finding people are doing that? We are. That's great. We are. We've from pre-med students to all the way through very, very experienced lifelong nurses. Our, we've, the feedback we've got so far has been fantastic. And the fact that we chunked it down into small bites so that someone can, if they got a spare 10 minutes, they can take a piece. And so it's, it's many, many steps where they can take it in 20 minute sessions or 10 minute steps, this kind of thing. So um, I know one of the things that, that's in the course is this list of burnout mythologies, you know, the, the idea about what, right. how we hold burnout. And, and so I'm going to raise a few okay. uh, on that list. And um, the complete list is available if people want to sign up for the course. It is. But yeah. let's just uh, take a few. Um, and, and one is um, if you have compassion fatigue, 
right. or you're burned out. It just means that you don't care enough. You're really not a caring person because right. a caring person would be able to get through this right. and not worry about themselves at all. So how do you... Completely fallacious. I mean, it, no. Uh, in fact, compassion fatigue hits the people who care the most first and hardest. And the first symptom of compassion fatigue actually is people working harder. And, and they give more. And then they give more but it becomes a devastating problem. And in the early days of the research on compassion fatigue by Charles Figley and, and team during the 1990s, it was originally called the embitterment syndrome. Embitterment. Embitterment syndrome. It's that phenomena of you've given and you've given and you've given and you've given and you've given even more and you've given more than you think you could give. Nobody's particularly appreciative. They want more and you start to get bitter about it. You've that resentment. And, and so, in fact, really the step one and probably the most important thing I could ever say this tonight is, is whatever it takes, cleanse your heart of bitterness. Mm -hmm. Because that will get you, you know, and, and it, will, it will poison your life. And so, but that can happen to the very best, most caring and dedicated people. If, if they are not wise about the way they um, deliver compassion. You know, it also reminds me that in the environment uh, that you're working in, um, the more you do, the more you get to do. Right. Y you know, and um, the right. expectation gets risen. Right. For, for, so you're the one, so it's kind of like, oh, give it to Simon, he'll do it. Right. Y you know, that more kind more of thing. And less and less. Yeah. And, um, and then there's that rescuer mode you come into, mm -hmm. like, well, if I don't do it, and they're not doing it, who will do it? Right. And it becomes, a re then it's not service anymore. It's resentment. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, it's rescue. It's coming out of a false set of identity, really. Yeah. And, and, not all, and on top of that, you make mistakes. Yeah. And, yeah. and you hurt people. Yeah. And, um, I mean, sadly, the number three cause of death in the United States is medical error. Wow. After cancer and heart disease, more than Alzheimer's, more than terrorism, more than anything else, medical errors. Wow. Uh, and so the whole idea of first do no harm is being violated. Wow. And, and so it, 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 there's some very real world consequences of this that are, are, are tragic. And that's why caregivers need to look after themselves because as Father Richard Rohr said, you know, pain that's not transformed is transmitted. Well, it gets transmitted by you making mistakes. Right. That's a very mm -hmm. concrete way. Yeah. And, and Atul Gawande's written about that, too. He has. And, and, yeah. and that works. Um, so the, I want to look at one of the other mythologies you have, which is um, self-care is selfish and indulgent. And you should always put other people first. You need to go last. Um, Right. You should feel guilty if you are taking time for yourself. I think of parents, particularly moms, mm -hmm. who could identify with that. What's, what's the answer for that one? Well, it goes back to what I said before. If don't make, it sets you up to make mistakes. Mm -hmm. So the very people in your care are going to get hurt because you're not thinking clearly, because you're exhausted, right. or you're emotionally out of balance because you've given way too much. Right. And, and so you make stupid decisions and, um, a, or just impulsive ones, right? Got it. And, and it hurts people. So put, putting, putting some energy into self-care and developing your own well-being and your own wisdom about it is, will help everybody in your care. It actually makes you more competent. So I want to address one last one, and you yeah. sort of touched on it with the class. Yeah. But I can imagine both professional caregivers and also people who are volunteers or family caregivers who would say to you, I don't have time to take yeah. care. I, I don't have time for this. There is not enough time in the day. How could I possibly take a course? Right. You know, there is that myth. I don't have time to take care of me. So tell me how your course helps me shift that and, okay. and the practicality of taking this course. Right. Well, yeah, it does go back to what I said. You, you, you don't have time not to do this. Uh -huh. Because it, 
okay, so you don't have time to look after yourself, so you, you, you get sick, you, you get emotionally out of sorts, your life's going to be shorter. Right. That's less time, right? right? I mean, the bottom line is we all have 24 hours in it every day. It's up to us what we choose to do with it. And we can live it in a way that preserves balance, builds virtue and character, and makes us more competent and able to care for others. Or we can try and burn the candle at both ends and, and find ourselves way out of balance, making bad decisions and hurting ourselves and others. So, so we, in, our, in our time left, yeah. how can people access this course? Because I right. think y y now it's online, if I it understand is. it. So, well, so, yeah. so tell people what they need to do and how they can take small bites. You said you could do 10 minutes of, it, of a, right. what's the total time of the, the course? Eight hours. Okay, so. But it can be split and you can do it at your own pace. So it's a self-paced program. It's accessible anywhere, anytime. So anytime that works for you. And it's accessible on your website. Yes, you get to it at um, adventuresincaring.org. Okay. And uh, it's right there. Just scroll to the bottom of the homepage. It's, it's there. And um, you can sign up. Uh, you'll have your own account set. So you can, and you can measure your progress as you go. Uh, and each, each step is, well, each chapter or session is about 20 minutes. And there's usually about four steps. In, in a chapter, so um, it's about five minutes each. And um, it's, it's a powerful thing, and I, I don't know that there's anything else quite like it. But we've designed it so it's a truly enjoyable thing. It's, it's applicable to professional caregivers, as we mentioned, uh, doctors and nurses. Um, so Simon, health, we're but, gonna yeah. have to stop it right okay. there, but right. thank you, adventuresincaring.org. And, um, I would like to thank uh, my crew, Michael Nicholson and Elliot Jacobson, and also TVSB for allowing me to do this program. Uh, if you'd like to see Simon's earlier uh, version, you can go to dyingingrace.com. We have our wonderful book of living love, and we'd invite you Great. to write the name of someone you would like to remember in our book. Simon, thank you so much for being here. Um, once again, enlightening and so much to share. Thank you.